<laughs> Happy Friday and welcome to the game on Pack State Live, the show where we talk about all the cybersecurity shenanigans you need to be aware of. This week we are kicking off Cybersecurity Awareness Month with a really neat series of shows dedicated to Cybersecurity Awareness Month, hopefully with a lot of broad information. Also, if you're a Pax Aider, make sure you stick around. And if you're playing the Capture the Flag contest, you'll really want to be paying attention to this episode. Later on, we're going to bring on Rob Anke and Chance Davis from Pax State's very own internal cybersecurity team to talk more about how we protect Pax State, but also some of the things we're doing that you can apply to your MSP and your customers. With that, let's jump straight into the news. You know, Dom, What's up, Matt? there's some coolness here, right? Because this is the first cybersecurity month where I feel like we're really starting to see a lot of cybersecurity engineers be part of this. And here's why. There's a super high level of snark in the comments about cybersecurity <laughs> awareness month. Like the memes I've seen this week, like, oh, this is the one month I have to care about cyber. And even in your own right, right. Dom, right? There's a certain amount of just I'm bitterness so grinchy of cybersecurity about cyber awareness months, month. Man. Yeah, yeah, a little grinchy. <laughs> Uh, we talked about it. But that said, it is the one month where we actually get to really talk about it, really focus on it, and in some ways highlight the unseen people that are out there protecting our worlds. And about the game and what we're doing in these next few episodes is we get to be able to bring on the real heroes, the ones that we hope nobody knows their name, the ones that we hope people don't see on a given basis, but also the ones that you and I, Dom, often interact with, right? Matt, are you doing this on your computer? Yes, I am this time, <laughs> Chance. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, and so it's fantastic to get to spend some time this month with all of our security teams. So I'm really excited about this set of episodes uh, and really excited because this is the first time at PAX 8 where we've had a really big cybersecurity month, like where we're doing CTFs and we're actually really focusing on it. And that's all led by some of the vision of Robert and Chance and some of their team and like, I don't know, man. It just gives me all the feels. So I suppose we'll get right into the, the news. But if you're paying attention uh, and you're on for this call, it's going to be a great conversation with some real security practitioners that kind of live this world and what they wish they could say to you uh, through the other 11 months of the year. <laughs> so <laughs> let's get started. We start with some not so great news. We actually talk about the outcome of some prospect me medical hospitals in dire state. Uh, after a post attack in August, an a cybersecurity attack on a national hospital chain makes medical care in underserved areas in Connecticut even harder to obtain. And the reason is that they said hackers from Rizidia, 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 sorry, ransomware as a service group claimed responsibility for an attack on Prospect Medical that forced the hospital's chain's IT systems to go offline for several weeks following an August 1 discovery of intrusion, see California hospital chain facing ransom. Prospect Medical reported Friday to regulators that the cyber tech compromised the protected or PHI, protected health and personal information of more than 190,000 individuals, which doesn't even pale in comparison to the one in, in Michigan right. last week. Swept up in the attack were there three Connecticut hospitals which went under an acquisition agreement, which now we're actually talking about a buyer buying somebody that just had a, a attack on their system. Yale New Haven Health said it's having serious second thoughts about buying the deal. It struck in October 2022 to buy these three hospitals. Like, so now we're at this point where you're past due diligence, you're past all these aspects, you're past letter of intent, you're about to write the check, you're buying them. They're going, mm, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know if we need to complete this deal. They basically said, we have mounting concerns about the viability of our transaction with Prospect Medical Holdings to acquire substantially all the assets of Waterbury ECHN uh, hospitals. U Yale New Haven Health said in a statement provided to Security Media Group, our concerns include deteriorating condition of the Waterbury and ECHN hospitals, so talking physical, particularly in light of the cyber attack last month and the State Office of Health strategy process to review the certificate of need application that we filed last month. So, you know, Don, what I want to tackle in this <clears throat> speak is that this actually caused, for the, for the first time I'm really quite aware of, an almost immediate reversal of an acquisition agreement that's been running for almost a year, right? This was signed in October right. 2022, so they've been working on this for a year. What are your thoughts on this, and do you think we start seeing more companies impacted by post-breach events and what they're worth from that? Well, this one sucks because it's a hospital, and they're hospitals and, and the article states, you know, underserved areas. Uh, yep. In healthcare terms, and even areas where people are reliant on an emergency room due to financial hardship and other factors, if these hospitals don't make it, there's there's real challenges of real life, right? Like people's health yeah. and 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 frankly survival. From an acquisition perspective, if I think I put my business hat on, and I'm mid mid deal, right? Like you said, we're doing the due diligence. Due diligence is done. 
probably getting ready to, to go to the closing table. Hell yes, I'm going to back out if there's this yeah, level of incident. Or at least change the price. Right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so yeah, I think this will be a common thing. And I think this has probably happened at least on smaller scales and less, less sensitive industries before. And it's just yeah. not as public, right? Um, so it sucks, but I do, I do honestly, again, if I was a buyer, I would probably make a similar decision or at least extend the deal so that I can figure out what I'm going to do with it. Yeah. And if you think back, like even in my event, right, when we had our massive ransomware incident, we bought a company. We, we knew for a fact three years ago, or I guess uh, four years ago now, I'm getting old, but we knew for a fact they had a massive cyber event. We already knew it. We were okay with it. We were buying them anyway. You fast forward three or four years and you're starting to see this become a weapon. And you're starting to see this saying, right. hey, if there's challenges in their internal IT department, their technology and security and all those things, are there other things I'm not aware of? Right? Are there other things that they brand poorly? And you're starting to see, I think, in my opinion, people tying cyber failures, cyber challenges with operational failures and operational challenges. You're starting to see people go, man, these are correlatable. How you deal with your own continuity of operations plan in an incident right. is also how you deal with a lot of other things operationally. And I think maybe that's part of what we're seeing is a lack of, of buyer confidence out of this, if, if nothing else, but just a great capitalistic strategic move to say, you just had a massive incident. We're really unsure about closing this, right? And what that means. Right. So I think we're going to see more of this. I just want to and stress I, too, yep. like this is one of the reasons I really wanted to talk about this article. The acquisition deal aside, you're bleeding, you're talking about healthcare organizations bleeding huge amounts of money into IT incidents. And the ramifications yeah. that are real, we we kind of ponder about the the impact on real human life a lot. And and again, sure. these hospitals shutting down with where they're located would be uh, probably now devastating. Four hour drive being somewhere honest. instead of thirty minutes, right, right? or ten minutes, right, yeah. right. Yep. And if you think about that, that means that you don't have adequate care in the right places in an underserved populace that people aren't necessarily going to profit from either. And so you have this real challenge there. So yeah, yeah. it's a great call out, right. And it, it definitely is one of the things where we're starting to see a direct impact to human life and to human operations from these cyber events, mainly in healthcare is the easiest path to cross that over, right? We saw it in the Birmingham incident right. with the baby that passed away as a result of them going to paper operations. But okay, so we beat this to death. I think the next one we wanna get into is really kind of arguing for something to be aware of, right? This is a, a news piece. So let's kick over to the next article. Last pass employees and customers targeted in pervasive phishing campaign. One of the things that happens is that once an event happens, we know about it, threat actors use it against us. On September 13th, LastPass customers began reporting phishing attempts. A variety of industries, including LastPass own 87 employees, were targeted in what the employee called a widespread, pervasive, and convincing phishing campaign. They first got something from marketing at sbit.co, th.th, which is weird because you're already at .co.th, so you're a subdomain, um, associated with a domain that wasn't previously linked with malicious activity. Yeah, because you can buy them. That's how this works. You can make new right. ones. <laughs> the email contained a link to Nine a phishing bucks. page that were hosted on the subdomain of customer-lastpass.su. So now you're getting into actually having a link that looks maybe reasonable. LastPass port partnered with Forda's Fish Labs to mitigate the risk. Unfortunately, the attackers registered a similar domain to credential phishing and began a second wave of attacks on the 19th. I think what you're getting at is, and this kind of all uh, was right around that understanding that passwords were starting to be compromised, right? Dom, you and I talked about this when we, we talked about this two years ago when this happened or a year and a half ago when this happened, that that data was now, even if you changed your password to your vault, it was already still that same on that vault and the one that they already have. It already was there. They could decrypt that. And so we actually started seeing news, maybe it was a month ago, Dom, of people that had had passwords in LastPass start to be being used in the wild, which gave indication of seeing people start to break these master passes on these databases, right? Back to your point, they had very low entropy. They were, they were easy passwords because they didn't have any requirements on those. And so what you're finding is now you're getting people taking advantage of that news rehashing the LastPass compromisation yet again and asking people to sign back in and do stuff, right? And what's smart about that is it just shows you how well connected the criminal element is to the day-to-day -day going on, right? To the understanding of the way people feel and the way people are going to react to something from a psychological perspective. And we're going to have Robert and Chance talk about some of this in our own organization about how phishing is, is very insidious, right? It is one of the best attack methods. In fact, I do a talk <clears throat> called How I Would Hack You 
with Tom Lawrence and Jason Slagle. And my shtick is identity attack and compromise through social engineering and SE type methodologies using phishing as one of the primary mechanisms, right, for that lure. So I think, you know, this isn't surprising to me, I guess is what I'm getting at, Dom. I don't know. What are your thoughts on it? This is this is natural evolution. Of Business as usual if you're a threat actor. I mean, COVID started, right, a couple of years ago. We oh, saw yeah. all kinds of COVID that. healthcare scams. Uh, such and such bank reports some problem now that it's just it's just normal and you have to be aware of that and i think if you're sort of quote the average person you need to have have in mind that if you're involved in some sort of compromise doesn't matter it could be last pass could be anyone uh that you are likely if your data is wrapped up in that to be fished in some regard right i've I was wrapped up in a, a moving incident related to the state of Colorado. I'm getting state of Colorado looking fishing stuff, right? And it's it's yeah. just normal. And when I think about it, I see it and I immediately know, but not everyone does. So just understand that that's how you're going to be targeted. Um, and just to reiterate what we said when we thought, when we thought now that we think vaults are getting cracked, whatever password manager you use, your master password needs to be impeccable and random. And the whole point is it's the one thing you got to remember, right? So yeah. make it real hard to remember and make yourself remember it, <clears throat> um, because that would go a long way. Well, and maybe I'm oversharing some of the ways you've tackled this, Dom, but some of the neat ways you can do this is have a very long and hard to remember piece that's stored on something that can reiterate that, let's say like a YubiKey or something, and some portion of that passphrase that you know. What's interesting is now you get back to this something you know and something you have aspect even prior to the authentication happening. The last pass I'll leave right. on last pass, the last piece I'll leave on last pass, I suppose, uh, phonetic <laughs> accidental there, but uh, is that the passwords in that vault are what are at risk right now because the master pass gets you to the vault. What's in the vault is what matters. So if you've already moved away right. from last pass or you're on last pass and you've rotated that master password, you still need to go find the most sensitive applications that are in that list and go change the stupid password. Because otherwise, they're right. going to be compromised at some point and they will be used against you. So just understand that, that that's kind of the dual nature of this one. Let's bring us to our last one. And this one's an interesting article. And it says, Russian's zero-day acquisition firm offers $20 million for Android and iOS exploits. Right? If you're not familiar, what is an exploit? An exploit is just something that's vulnerable inside of a piece of code or application or system that I now can use an exploit against that to gain some position, whether that be remote code execution, whether that be data and access or reading subdirectors. Or sell or like a product sensitive. in this case. Yeah, or a product. Launched in 2021, the firm says it provides technologies for offensive and defensive operations in cyberspace and claims to be working with private and government organizations in Russia, which if that doesn't terrify you, they probably should. <laughs> right. This week, the company announced it was boosting the bounties offered for Android and iOS exploits due to high demand on the market. Sorry, I, I, I can't. I just can't. High demand on the market, which really means I want to pwn you. Uh, these right. exploits are often used by to spy on specific targets or incorporated in spyware versions and vendors to their products, which are then sold to the totalitarian regimes. And we already saw this, right? We, we saw this with the NSO group. Group and, and Pegasus. And, and the only reason the NSO group ever suffered from that was because they decided to spy on the Israeli government as an Israeli company, and that didn't work well for them, uh, ultimately. But basically, you know, and we can cut back to this, Dom, when you start thinking about this, these bounties for, for these bugs aren't being paid to the companies. And I talk about this on stage a lot, right? Like I show the ecosystem of all the different players in the ransomware gang, and there's just so many pieces, but it often starts with one. It starts with that one vulnerability researcher that one guy or gal that pokes away and finds a vulnerability. And you know what they don't have the ability to do? They don't have the ability to sell it to the company that gives a crap about it. So what do they do? They sell it to the threat actor. And I think the advocation I'd make, and I'd make the same one to Pax8, why do you not have a bug bounty program? You should be able to buy these bugs back from these threat actors in a way that's meaningful to the system and the ecosystem and doesn't force a lot of these people's hands into the criminal element. And if I was offered $20 million for an Android bug and Android said they don't care about paying me, who am I going to sell it to? If I'm in some right. level of a country where that is not necessarily as morally dis, uh, reprehensible from that perspective. And so I think, you know, you get into this point where this one doesn't surprise me, but it should scare you a little to understand that as companies and as software vendors don't build things secure by design and secure by default, have plans to solve CIS controls controls because guess what in control 16 there are things about bug bounties there are things about how you receive a vulnerability there are controls and safeguards and most companies just aren't there and that's a capitalism problem not a Pax8 or other company problem that's that's a capitalism problem so I think this is one of those that really highlights how inequitous 
the world is right now towards a criminal element content compared to people that want to do the right thing. And if anybody wants to make fun of me in the comments, that's fair. I am a researcher. I do and would love to sell my bugs to people. Uh, I don't sell them to bad guys. I finished that up with that statement, I suppose. We should move on. Uh, not even for show. 20 million bucks. Not even for 20, maybe 10. Oh, wait, that's 20 is more than 10, as I understand it, Tom. Maybe I'm in the wrong business. Perhaps. Let's hear some yeah. wise words from Robin Harris, and then we'll come back with our amazing guests and get into Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Privacy is a big deal. And privacy touches our lives very deeply and in a personal way. I get these emails to this particular email address. And it's basically because a vendor was breached. They got all our email addresses. And now I'm getting fake invoices from PayPal, fake invoices from Amazon. And the only reason I can just look at them and see that, oh, this is, this is part of that breach is because of the email. But what if it was the email that I use every day? Our data is so important and we really have to take steps to keep our private data private. We really need to take responsibility for when we go out and we sign up for things and we put all our information in there and then we forget about it. We're not even using the service anymore and our data is still sitting there. We never close the account and it's still sitting there. It's your name, your address, you know, birth date, all this other kind of stuff. So even going back and closing, if it's something you're not using anymore, go close it. Go close it. Send the people an email, say, delete my account, please. There's a lot we can do to protect ourselves. And this even goes with our children and our spouses. I mean, at work, at home, it's a big deal. And when there's a breach, it can really disrupt people's lives. You don't want to be on the end of it, and you don't want to be part of the cause of it. There you go. All right, and as, as Robin's brilliant words, you don't want to be at the end of it, and you don't want to be the cause of it. She's so wise, man. That's a, I love that's a, bad, that's a bad attach. Hey, before we get into the guests, there was a comment that came up before we started the show that I wanted to address. Sure. Um, about an incident with Clorox. And I actually haven't read much into this incident, but I think you read a little bit into it. Um, we got asked to cover it. So I wanted to make sure we, we gave positive energy 34 hours a day and seven days a week on this one. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, that's a long I had day. To. No, it's fair. That's a long Three, four, day. seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a security. So day. I think yeah. I read into it a little bit. I got a little bit. This only really dropped from a news perspective in the last couple of days, and they basically said, "Hey, listen, we've had a major event. It's it's causing problems in our world. We don't know what our remediation timeline is." And I think to to hit the point by positive energy is really just why would they not know that timeline? And I think that's probably a perfect opportunity. I'm going to give a little bit of my conjecture, but to get in some way in on some of our internal security team that lives in this world, right? And so in my mind, it's it's one of a few things. It's either going to be, there's still an investigative for, uh, set at this point. They haven't filed a KA. We don't necessarily have the incident discussion. They're within that first few days. And if I had to guess, they're just really talking about it super duper early. And you get into a place where a lot of companies try to not talk about an incident for a while until they know more, try to be, you know, maybe potentially less communicative about it until they have to. And Dom, you and I have even talked about this. We're seeing companies talk about incidents earlier and earlier and earlier in their incident life cycle, yep. right? Cisco came out and talked about it within like- Which is four great, days by the way. Event. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. If you're at home and you're watching this, that actually has been an endemic challenge with a lot of, a lot of players is that there's almost been the stigma of talking about an incident. And so as a result, nobody wants to talk about it. Microsoft broke that mold last year. Well, gosh, now I'm getting old two years ago when they actually came out of the SolarWinds <laughs> event and said, hey, we had a major compromise of our network and our source code was touched. That was the Microsoft right. doctrine. It was the first time we talked about companies wanting to talk about their challenges early on, even before they know what's going on. And if I had to put a guess in, Clorox is not aware yet of what their remediation looks like because they're still investigating what the containment options look like. 
how broad it is, how much it's been touched, and how much spread it has before they could ever speak towards bringing it back online. So you've got a how many differing first, opinions? Matt. It's important. <laughs> They got to pour some Clorox in it first. They're like, man, the servers haven't cleaned up from the Clorox. It's still there. It's causing problems. Yeah. No, no I agree. You don't know what you don't know. And if you can start that conversation early, I think, and, and so long as you continue that conversation, by the way. That's true. Um, yeah. I think it shows a lot, a lot that you're you're coming out and saying, hey, we have a problem. We're trying to figure out what this problem is. Um, and we're we're going to keep moving forward. Yeah. Well, let's get some other opinions. We actually have the blessed opportunity. We've seen some chats in the comments of people saying, I want to shout out to my unsung heroes too. Um, and so let's bring on a couple of those rock stars that live in our world. I'd like to bring in uh, Robert and Chance and let's have them join our conversation, please. Awesome. Welcome, boys. Uh, welcome to the okay, limelight. Hey, how's it going? Here we go. It's awesome. So let's pose that, that first question from our audience and we'll start with Chance. What are your thoughts on why Clorox hasn't announced a time for remediation at this point in time, one day after announcement or two days after announcement? Well, so it's hard. You have to find, you know, the root cause, like you were saying, they probably don't know yet. And if you don't know what the root cause is, you probably don't want to talk about it more because if you haven't, you know, patched it or anything, more people are going to want to get in. Yeah, and true so, story. Yeah, in fact, we've seen that play out, yeah. Chance. That's a great call out because we have seen that play out in, in former actor activity, right? And and people are saying, hey, they weren't popped by one. They were actually popped by three uh, different actors. Right. And we've seen that play out in several incidents. Great call out. Rob, what do you think, brother? We're just having some conjecture amongst friends here. <laughs> For sure. Um, ultimately, there's going to be a whole, like, there's, going to either be like a couple of people working on one aspect of it and a couple of people working on another. So like if there is, there's not like a, a, a linear, like we don't, we can't find anything. We're, we're digging through logs. We're looking at, you know, we're analyzing you know, through this and there's, there's not an answer yet. Everything looks fine, yeah. but we know that there's something happened. Um, sure. I'm not going to share that. Hey, we haven't found anything yet. We're still working on it. Right, right. You're not just going to share. No news. Um, although right. the joke, you know, ironically, I think when you're dealing with a major incident as a company, the cadence is more important than what you have to say, as long as you don't overstate or, or wrongly state. And I think there is perfect value in saying we still don't know. I think to your point, coming out and having a regular cadence says, guess what? We're in a major ransomware incident. Don't keep bothering me. I won't have an answer for you. But if you'll go to this communication page, we're going to have an update every X. And that update may still be still investigating root cause analysis, still investigating root cause analysis, to your point. Um, and so, you know, we have that at PAX 8, right? We have a status page when systems are down that speak towards on some cadence what we're doing and what we know and what we don't know, at least. And I think the other piece to wrap up that's a corollary, I was part of my um, I, I'm on the emergency response team with CompTIA, and we were writing some of our guidelines for the things we want people to talk about. And one of the biggest guidelines we give people is, A, don't put anything in writing, and B, don't put anything in writing if you don't know what the hell you're talking about. The answer is just, I don't know. <laughs> and that's an acceptable answer. I'm still working on this. So, right. man, great, great calls from each of you. So, the audience doesn't know you. What I'd love to do is give you each an opportunity to kind of tell me who you are, talk about what you do, your role and what that role means to cybersecurity in general. So I'll let you boys Rochambeau over who goes first, and and then we'll uh, we'll figure it out. I can uh, go well, first. I'll take it. It's... Oh well. Oh, I want to <laughs> there we go. <laughs> that was a Canadian standoff. All right, Rob, you win. I heard yeah. it first. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm a senior cybersecurity analyst with Pax Eight, um, and analyst is the big key there. I'm I am looking at um, you know. The phone scans I'm looking at are our, our current logs. I'm looking at any alerts. I'm you know constantly documenting uh, just just processes so that we can continue you know ultimately hopefully keeping up our security posture. And I get to work with some really dope people in my team. So um, <laughs> I'm happy to send it off to Chance at this point. Yeah, and I would actually ask how many times do you get frustrated having to go, hey Dom. Are you actually doing something? Dark Trace just popped up, and you're like, "No, I was just reading an article for the game. I'm sorry." Does that ever come up into your world? Zero. The I mean, no. maybe there's there's a couple people that's probably watching okay. right now that, okay. that that know, it's like, "Hey, hey," <laughs> and then some just emoji conversations over over the the chat. It's fair. Sure. 
I, I hope I've never been a part I, of your emoji conversations, but I'll turn it to chance <laughs> on that one. <laughs> Real quick, I'll say I actually like it when we get alerts for people like Matt and Dom and stuff because it's going to be an easier conversation. But anyways, I'm Chance. I'm a cybersecurity engineer. I mostly help architect tools and stand them up and um, I'll help with like data collection for Rob, you know, if we need to pull data off an API or whatever, put in the Power BI, we do a lot of that. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much me. So if I understand it, Chance, then, you know, Rob, you're mostly on that analysis, receiving information, trying to parse it, trying to make decisions, trying to decide where we bring in other partners. And Chance, you're building the world. Right, you're doing the actual building of that from a cybersecurity engineer. How do we safely connect this? How do we put it together? How do we build this? How do we integrate these things? What's too much data? What data matters and what should we? So is that a lot of what your world is, is taking those requirements and conditions of what we're doing and then building stuff as a result of that chance? And is that a fair codification of your world? Yeah, I'd say mostly I'm in the like information side. So I help us get more information, you know, through our tools and all that. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. And then I look at so, that and say, "This is too much information. Let's let's <laughs> tweak it. Down. Let's it down make sure that we can ultimately set, you know, create that workflow moving forward on like, hey, hey, tech services or whatever. Let's let's help help me help you because this is what we're seeing. Yeah. So Very one of the things team. that I like to talk with people about is. The difference between, and as we get into this, and I'd love for you to weigh in on this maybe potentially, the difference between attack surface and protect surface. And so for our kind of educative point that I'd love to do is let's just go around the room and maybe see if people can talk about what is the difference between an attack surface and a protect surface. Dom, if you want to start. Uh, so a protect surface is everything in your wheelhouse that you're responsible yep. for. All that you own. Front to back, everything. An attack surface is what you've created some sort of avenue that could be exploited, compromised, attacked, what have you, potentially. Um, so you can have a, a, a separate protect surface from an attack service and that certain things just aren't frankly connected or exposed uh, in such a way, or they're behind a piece of said attack surface. They're protected by said attack surface um, and you could spend more of your time focusing on that attack surface. Yeah, I don't think we need any other definitions that pretty well lays it out, right? I think the point is, is the attack surface is what I've chosen to let a threat actor attack. The protect surface is everything in my entire domain that I must protect. And so what I'll turn over to you two is, in your own way, can you tell me how PAX8 tries to manage the attack surface and reduce the attack surface, right? And, and Rob, you've talked about a few things that's already triggered me, like vulnerability management and exposability and things like that. But is that part of your day-to-day -day worlds? And if you would, just kind of tell me where it falls into your world and how you help reduce the attack surface of PAX-8. Well, I'll let Rob go on Google that first. because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. I'll go. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, so if it, what you guys talked about with, with the protect surface is like everything that you put out there. Um, and ultimately, like from what we see is, you know, if we're going to think like the actor it's that, that's trying to, to get your information, like what, what can we easily get? And what, what's the best value of trying to get information from this user? And typically that's like, oh, you know, full names, that's email addresses, that's phone numbers, birthdays, bank account information, all of the above. Um, and I guess in the PAX8 world, it's like if we, we need to make sure that if we're going to put this information out there specifically for work, uh, you know, press the button, sensitive sensitivity label. And then the things that we're working on, the tools that we have already have those walls that come up. Right. Yeah. And that helps us make sure that that information doesn't get shared um, in like outside of work. That's that's kind of up to you. Right. So if you're going to share stuff like in, in, in social media or if well, you I, have. I, I don't want to get past this. I don't want to okay. escape this okay. one because okay. I think it's, it's actually that it. valuable. Right. So you yeah. just touched on one piece of reduction of the attack surface, which is by not allowing data that's sensitive to leave our organization. Right. And when you think about that, you're getting into actually saying, hey, I'm going to have 3.7 in CIS, which says establish and maintain a data classification scheme. But I'm also going to then have 3.11 that says encrypt data at rest. I'm going to have 
things that like 313 that say reduce the law, data loss prevention, introduce a data loss prevention yeah. solution, right? And what's interesting is I think you, you actually nailed it on the head with one simple phrase. We ask people to say how sensitive is this data and we ask them to sensitivity label it, which means if I say something secret or in organization, then the actual attack surface of that data is reduced by the fact that it's encrypted, by the fact that it's done with Azure rights management, by the fact that it's now automatically and systemically protected from loss, which means if I steal that data, it's not valuable to me, which means you took something that right. was in my protect surface data that's sensitive and implemented controls based on that catalog categorization to bring it down to a lower attack surface, that that data is now in an encrypted state that can't be removed. And so I really think that's pretty big. And I, li I like to talk to security practitioners because we can kind of just highlight those things that you and I just go, oh yeah, we have sensitivity data. We have sensitivity labels. But what does it really mean? It really means we're reducing our attack surface and we're encrypting data and we're satisfying three or four safeguards in CIS with raw data. So I just didn't want to let that get completely glossed over. On that one. And it's and it's it's it sometimes it's like a new thing to do, right? Like I'm I'm sure. popping these Excel sheets, I'm doing Word documents, I'm doing like I'm sending emails out to folks on my lead, and I'm like, hey, I'm coming up to the end of the quarter, I got to get these out, right? And ultimately, it's it's not like an automatic behavior, and that's something that we got to learn, right? And that's something that we want to, yeah. you know, provide some awareness in. It's like it's that button. If you need to move it on your on your ribbon, just so it's bigger. You click it, and then you, you can go about your day. I feel, I feel like that'll definitely help us on our end, like yeah. protect you guys for sure, a lot easier. Yeah, 100%. So People Chance, I'm going to ask you the same question. Email thread, oh, and I hit a reply, and I suddenly mark their whole email thread, facts say confidential. It's their favorite. doesn't annoy them at all. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you're telling on yourself, Dom. You're right. It's their favorite. Now they can't use this email thread with anybody except for signing into their custom portal. I'll turn the same question on you, Chance. Like, help me understand in your mind how you and your organization, and I think probably on the engineering side, probably almost have more of this in your day to day. But how do you help reduce the attack surface when the protect surface is unlimited? How do you help that impact safety? So you got to kind of do like a risk analysis. You got to know what's important to protect and what isn't. And so if we have our whole protect service, we have to prioritize what we think is, you know, important. So we've got our endpoints, we use EDR you know, that reduces that attack surface a lot for endpoints. Yeah, and, for sure. uh, you know, general stuff like that, like we've got email protection and all that. And so- it's Protecting data and vector, identities, right? Yeah. Yep, well, so data and phishing and spam and all that, you know, I think you have to make it as easy as you can on the end user to not be the weak link. True story, bro, 100%. 100%. I think that's probably the codification of that point for you, Chance is really, you know, the Brian Krebs theory, which really is this, make it harder for users to do the wrong thing and easier for them to do the right. And I think that's a great point you're making is that a security operations team and some of the things you're doing to help keep data private and, and, and inside our world are directly one-to-one -one correlatable to a lot of those statements, right? So it's fantastic, very good. All right, so I actually have a video we prepared and for any Anybody watching the video that's going to give you your CTF key, sorry for playing with your emotions like that, but the next one maybe. But I want to introduce what is Cybersecurity Awareness Month? Where does it come from? So if you guys don't mind, let's go ahead and roll that video for us and we'll talk about where CSAM started or, or Cybersecurity Awareness Month started. Since 2004, the President of the United States and Congress have declared the month of October to be Cybersecurity Awareness Month a dedicated month for the public and private sectors and the tribal communities to work together to raise awareness about the importance of cybersecurity. The Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, and the National Cybersecurity Alliance, NCA, are partnering to create resources and messaging for organizations to use when they talk with their employees, customers, and memberships about staying safe online. So thinking about Cybersecurity Awareness Month and how we're in the middle of this, we started, you know, what I'd love to have you talk about for people is how can they be aware of protecting their own private information and data? So let's take this away from Pax8 and let's just get advice from practitioners. Rob, why don't you start us off? How can people protect themselves online? How can I protect that private data and private information? 
I mean, you can literally just stick your computer and bury it in concrete and, you know, stick dirt on top of it. And you'll <laughs> Good never strategy. Be yeah. There's a balance of accuracy there, though, however. Uh, right, 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 right. But, I mean, it's you, you just have to be aware of what information you share on the internet. And that, that includes, like what I said earlier, sorry, and then you reeled me in, um, with social media, um, whether, you know, you know, setting up all these accounts um, that that goes out there that you know that you're tr that you'll have a password you know associated with things like that, um, and I mean, and then when you have when you pop children out, you have to be aware of what they're putting out there as well, or and and ultimately provide some sort of um, you know. You know, be, you know be, being a good cyber aware parent is a big thing in our house, especially since I've you know, you know, children that that are now being online. Um, so there's there's a couple aspects of like recognizing where what your digital footprint is, and ultimately practicing any digital hygiene that you can do, not only for yourself but for the people around you. Um, yeah. Recognizing, hey, is, how is my kid a target? Recognizing how my mom is a target, or my yeah. grandparent is a target, and like, you know, you you put cybersecurity on your LinkedIn profile, and now they go to you when they get scammed. So it's it's practicing <laughs> what you preach in every aspect of your life. <laughs> it's a little bit of. I, what I love Henry Tim's I, answer in the audience. <laughs> Henry says, "Thermite." <laughs> OSINT poisoning, data broker removal, and minimizing metadata. And we're going to tackle a couple of those, right? OSINT, real quick, stands for Open Source Intelligence. So we got a little acronym game going there for OSINT. But thermite, that's just thermite. Yeah, that's aluminum shavings, aluminum oxide, and, and some serious oxidizers, and it burns through stuff. So I do agree with that. It would destroy your computer. But the second one I want to target, and I want to talk to a little bit, which is OSINT poisoning or open source intelligence poisoning. I particularly like this one. I'm a big fan of the combination of OSINT poisoning and data broker removals, where I put out bad data, lots of bad data. I think I have like 19 birthdays a year based on the different platforms I'm in. I have five <laughs> different cities I live in. I have many different addresses. I have 20 different email addresses that are all bogus or fake or potentially real. And so you get into this world where scattering bad data out there along with your good data and then reducing the good data is an strategy. So let's talk about that. Um, Chance, one of the things that we offer to all of our employees is a way to help reduce that data from data brokers and data broker removals. So tell me a little bit about that. What do you what do you, we do here for our employees around helping them remove some of that data that's out there? So we have a service that we, a uh, company that we partner with and they do like credit monitoring and they do, I think like dark web monitoring and all that. Yep. So they have your information and you've consented to them having your information and they will use that information to see what other information might be out there, what might be getting used against you. You know, someone tries to open a credit card in your name, you get an alert and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I, I think that one, two strategy of paying for a data broker removal service, there's tons of them out there, right? You have like LifeLock, Aura, you have a bunch of different players out there. But if you're personally at home and not using a service like Aura or not using some kind of data broker removal service and you ask why is it valuable? Well, because all of these brokers that buy your data also provide that data out to others. And if I'm a threat actor, I pay for that data because I can attack yep. you with it. So I use it. And so the argument is remove the good data sources that you can and try to poison the bad data sources as much as possible with bad fake data, which won't get removed about you because it's not accurate. So Aura or those services won't remove that about you. And I think what's interesting about it is PAX 8, and, and maybe you could correct me if I'm wrong on this, Chance or, or Rob, understand the value of the human that works for them and how many ways they can be coerced. You know, and that's one of the things that people don't think about is, back to your point, Rob, where you said that maybe grandma is a target or maybe your junior is a target. It's not a far leap of logic to force someone to do something from a compromised position by targeting someone else they love, right? We've seen these scams where there's child sexual exploitation, things that we've talked about in the past with Lindsay and her team. And those type of things, you know, a lot of times they, they, they actually extort the kid. And the parents, they're like, listen, we're going to send out this picture to everybody on your Facebook and everybody on grandma's Facebook if you don't actually pay us. But how far of a leap of logic is that for that to jump from extorting based on you to do something to extort you to do something with your company? 
right? And we've seen that play out before. We've seen extortion work where someone would compromise a Matt Lee and force me to take advantage of my privileged position to do something inside the organization, Matt Lee. And so that's one of those concerns, I think, that it's really great to see a company like Pax8 actually paying for these services for all of the employees to realize there's a correlation between real Matt and Matt that works at Pax8. And those two have overlap in some Venn diagram perspective. So one of the things that we've seen, I don't know who wants to speak to this, is like you see shifts away from cookie-based data moving into the browsers themselves holding the data and general understanding of like even power uh, plugins and how those interact with your day-to-day -day private lives. Can anybody speak towards like how the this shift in where our data is and the, the main access point is our browser is also turning into more challenges for us? I'm going to set the stage just a touch more okay. before we dive into this because a lot of people don't know this. Historically, you visit website A, website A sets cookie on your browser, right? Cookies are hugely important, by the way. It's how you log in. It's how they track people for load balance. There's a lot of functional uses for cookies. So they're not bad. Try and cheat so let's say diet. I visit. No, <laughs> yeah, they do. Cookies. They do. An, that's not a good thing, though. It's not a good use of a cookie. <laughs> uh, so, so if we expand that, like, let's say I go to website B, and website B has advertising partnerships with Meta or Facebook. They have advertised partnerships with Microsoft. They have advertised partnerships with Google, et cetera, right? Amazon is a big one in this. Uh, now you get a cookie from all of those websites. And then I go to website C and I get a cookie from the same list of companies, and et cetera, and et cetera. And this follows me around the internet, right? And eventually I have an anonymous identifier uh, based on this, this set of cookies. And I start to understand exactly what you do. And I've done this from the marketing angle of targeting people. And I could target the dude who lives in five cities, has 19 birthdays and a beard, and present him with ads. I know a guy right? like, like that. We can, we can do that. Um, yeah. Now flip that, and Google has come up with this this kind of ridiculous idea of saying, you're right, guys. You all hate cookies. You're all blocking them with, with, with plugins and whatnot. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a feature to our browser that does the same thing just locally, and then every website you go to, uh, we send in a header that says, you know, Matt really likes gluten-free tacos. Like that's his he thing. Loves them. Right? Fantastic. Right? Like, and so now we're saying, still relatively anonymized in the grand scheme of things until we find a way to exploit this, or what actors do, um, which won't take long, by the way. Imagine every website you're going to is like, I can't tell you who this dude is, but he really likes gluten-free tacos and jerky and chips. Has nine right? names, right? And signs in with all and these has, different. It has nine names in five <laughs> cities, right? So that's what we're talking about. It's a shift in this tracking technology that personally I hate. But um, what do you guys think? I also kind of hate it, but I could see some upside to it. I think it definitely it makes me feel worse that all of my you know marketing data is just right there you know i clear my cookies often and i don't feel like i have that same control if it's just you know running in the browser like that yeah um and that's another thing too is what kind of exploits could lead to like collecting all that data out of the you know the browser google's never and had a even... single vulnerability not at all <laughs> no <laughs> never <laughs> <laughs> another yeah, thing too is uh, i don't know about that <laughs> If you've got all that data in one place and you're this guy who lives in five cities or whatever and likes, you know, gluten-free tacos, if you awesome. can collect all of that, it's very easy to correlate that back to maybe a real identity. Yep. True story. 100% accurate. Especially if you are scattering that bad data of multiple places that now only lines up to you, right, to that point. So, yeah. and, and I think in general, we've, you know, I talk about this a lot. We've, we've again took the value out of something we can do with tech before we thought about the security and impact. And I think the call to action and the one big takeaway here is cookies track you. The things you do on the internet are tracked. They are correlatable back to some Ray ID of some information that you're this person so they can sell to that entity, right? And I think that as you think about that, find ways to limit cookie use. After GDPR, almost every website that does any business in Europe now has to say, you want all cookies? You want just tracking cookies or just functional cookies or performance cookies. And you make that choice. And I personally make the choice today to do almost no cookies except for what is absolutely necessary for the function platform to, to work. And I have real questions and suspicion when it's in the browser level that's tracking this information and not in the browser vis-a-vis -a, -vis a cookie ordained by an entity that has asked for this cookie. 
that you could even see more and more collaboration to track more and more of this data as part of their commercial viability in a Google or in a Chrome type browser from that company. So I, I, I do agree. Chance, I think I'm with you and there's some cool stuff about it because it lowers the ease of just stealing a physical file, a cookie that has been stored on the disk somewhere, something that must be extracted from an application. But it does give me some serious concerns over the privacy implication of someone actively tracking that inside their browser, as opposed to a passive response to websites asking for that tracking. So that'd be my my thoughts on it. Rob, what do you have on this this matter? We've we've beaten this horse. I mean, the tongue's hanging out. It's already dead. I think but, I think, yeah. I think it's pretty deep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I agree with what there. Chance is just saying. Um, yeah, but there. I mean. <laughs> well, then, then let's bring this to something in your world. One of the things that I like to think about is you talk about earlier, Rob, looking at our world the way the threat actors do, right? And by the way, Dave Z says his date of birthday is Jan 1, 1901. Like, that a boy. Like, talk about a century, baby. Crushing it. Uh, but, yeah, so you talk <laughs> about this data and looking at it through an adversary's perspective or looking at it from a threat actor's perspective. What are some ways that people can actually do that themselves? What are some ways that people can look at what data is out there for them that they need to be aware of and make some changes? on? Um, I mean, the easiest way is just to put your name in the Google search. Let's see what, sure. what, what um, things pop up, see what data brokers are selling about your name. And then, you know, ultimately, you know, clicking that three dot menu and going through it and seeing if, hey, my information is in there. There's stuff that I don't want it to be searchable and you can, you know, go that way. Are there things uh, that, that people have passwords and such that are easy to find that way too? Or how would I find out if, um, if passwords have been compromised or if there are things about my accounts or products I use? How would I look at that? Uh, if I was a threat actor, I'd go and, and check out some, some uh, tour websites and check out what what breaches are available. That's that's sure. out there. Um, that's. But if you're not, and if you're a human there's a, consumer, there's a special website too, um, where if you put your email out, it'll say yeah. how much how many emails come out. Can I say that? And, and it even this? has a response if you don't have it, and that response exactly. may or may not be a flag. The, in our CTF. Uh, and year. what I love Legend. about that is people know what the flag, <laughs> the people that know what the flag is makes me feel better because their PAX 8 they email was not. Exactly. What sucks is the ones uh, that were compromised can't get that challenge. Or they can make a friend. I think my I mean, number's only is, at 19. There is a group oh, that they can, man. you know, commiserate. Good joy. With. <laughs> that brings me to another point. I want to do a couple things real quick. So first, we've actually prepared a pretty cool video of just a few basic things you can do to protect yourselves. And I'd like to roll that. And then we'll get in and talk about our CTF. And then for all the people that are work at PAX 8 that are hanging around, I know why you're hanging around. And that's why I'm doing it at the end, not right now. Uh, so it's great to have you here. We'll be back in just a minute. Check Twenty twenty three marks the twentieth annual Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and this year CISA is launching a new awareness program that will encourage four simple steps everyone can take to stay safe online. Simple actions we should all take, not only during Cybersecurity Awareness Month, but every day throughout the year. Four things you can do to keep yourself cyber safe. Number one, use strong passwords and a password manager. Strong passwords are critical to protecting data. Number two, turn on multi-factor authentication, or MFA. You need more than a password to protect your online accounts, and enabling MFA makes you significantly less likely to get hacked. Number three, recognize and report phishing. Phishing emails, texts, and calls are the number one way data gets compromised. Be cautious of unsolicited emails, texts, or calls asking for personal information. Number four, update software. Ensuring your software is up to date is the best way to make sure you have the latest security patches and updates on your devices. Regularly check manually for updates if automatic updates are not available and keep operating systems, antivirus software, web browsers, and applications up to date. Remember these tips and stay cyber safe. 
That's awesome, right? I think reporting phishing is probably one of the ones that Robert probably is shaking his head the most about, right? Because that's a lot of where you live is like, I want to see that healthy, active reporting that shows, even if you're wrong, that shows you're out there looking for these phishing examples, that you're out there seeing where someone's attacking us. And interestingly enough, right, Rob, increasing the collective intelligence about what we know about our threat surface and what's being done against us, right? Is that a fair statement on why phishing reporting is so important? You're taking you're taking this information seriously, and you're taking your awareness training seriously. And ultimately, when something is like ninety plus percent of the way that people get internal access to you know a, 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 a compromise, um, why the heck not? Like I don't mind beating <laughs> yeah. that horse. <laughs> yeah, like, keep reporting them. I'll tell you when you're wrong. It'll be fine. It's great. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You know, you you came to me, Rob, about about four months ago, maybe it's been a little longer. And you told me Dude, your plan for cyber like security March. month. Was it March? Good God. Yeah. Now, tell me about what you pitched and what's come to reality. Let's talk about this a little bit. Cause you came to me with one cool idea and I was like, bro, so much. Yes. Like this has to happen. What did you do? Tell me about it. Oh, the beauty, the beauty, well, I can I come from, uh, an educational background and ultimately when you get a month, that's like, you know, dedicated to a specific thing, then you, that's called a unit, right? So you can like build sure. up like people's understanding of, you know, cybersecurity in general, because, hey, I got 31 days. That's, that's a lot of time. <laughs> like I can put a lot of information on that, right? And so one of the things that I like found out was if you make something fun, people are going to learn more about a specific, um, you know, specific uh, subject, um, and it'll hopefully be retained that much better, right? So, yeah. um, like, how are we gonna, you know, make it fun for people to, you know, learn about cybersecurity awareness outside of like a compliance training that they're forced to do? And you know, I'm I'm guilty of it. I brute force through some of those questions a lot. Um, and until I get the right answer, um, and do I retain a lot of that? I don't know. Yeah, I have to, but I knew that before. Um, so sure. like what, you know, making this into a game was super cool. And then trying to get excitement from the get go and getting buy-in from just folks, you know, in, in C level and folks from other departments and people walking, you know, like just, just the engagement that we're seeing in in teams um, through like, hey, like how can I help? Like this is where I am um, on this specific game. Like, you know, <laughs> someone commiserate with me. Uh, that that's really <laughs> cool. So, what we are doing. So what what I came to uh, to to um, Matt with was like, okay, this is my idea. We have four weeks in October. Like we're gonna do themed weeks. Um, and ultimately try and give some cyber, you know, awareness information to folks in Pax8 each week yep. um, and, and you know, make it a game, get points on certain things, and ultimately get a sweet, sweet prize at the very end. Um, and can you show and, everybody what that sweet, sweet prize is? Because yeah. it's even it's sized game. enough for me. It's sized enough for my fat <laughs> self. So what do you have? It's you got this. the belt. Yeah, right it's here. so it's a, it's a belt. So if you're yeah, a yeah. Like, this is yeah. this is the Rob, the Rock pose, right? So it's, it's, the rock a, it's a sweet yeah, belt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm excited about it. It's got, it. got like win. Cyber CTF champ on the bottom. It's yeah, got. Yeah, yeah. It's got like some flags. Uh, US your number flags, one. Number one. What sure. Is this? What is and it? And then there's like. Cybersecurity Month 2023. So if this like ends up like being, I feel Matt like Lee's it's house. being successful in the last first week or whatever. Um, I mean, we can possibly Let's get another one it. next month, next year, yeah. or whatever. I don't wow. know. But it, well, it's, first off, I'm already it, winning. I got job. like I, I'm already got this on lock. Like I'm number one right now. I don't know, Chance, if you've seen that or yeah. not, but I do have. Yeah, it's because you cheated. I did cheat. <laughs> 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 Why would I not? But to be fair, let's bring this back to where everybody else can win. 
Let's go ahead without any yeah. more ado. We do have a CTF. It's amazing. Rob and team are crushing it with it. There's 170 so people playing it. Lots of people commiserating to your point, Rob. But go ahead. Let's go ahead and expose this secret. Let's give it to them with two minutes left in the show. What's the, the flag they've been missing? Here it is. The flag for CTF. And screenshot now. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> and it. possibly it. put it in a chat somewhere. It's going to show up down in chat. Yeah, so Claire is going to pop it in chat. If you're a Paxator, I'm going to go ahead and pop over the leaderboard. And let's just see real quick um, if anybody's watching in live. Going to get this scoreboard challenge. Here we are. Matt leads on top for now. Like That's awesome. I'm looking at you, TPI Mental or Bant or Omleted Fromage. I'm mean, really questioned about the omelet du fromage. <laughs> I believe that's just the cheese omelet, but it sounds really bad, uh, <laughs> at least from a colloquialism perspective. But yeah, so that's really it, y'all. And I think the point is that you've made really well, Rob. When you find yourself in a month that's dedicated, it's a unit. And that unit is meant to be made up with lessons that we can learn, ways we can all be better, and ways we can improve and raise our cybersecurity posture and hygiene. And I think that we're all reeling from the fact that just like all humans, we take technology first for how much it improves our lives and then figure out how to secure it and protect it. And so a lot of people were just now starting to actually think about, maybe I shouldn't answer all those quizzes on Facebook. Maybe those things are actually Matt trying to trick me so he can know what my favorite food was, so he can reset my password. And so we're starting to do that. And Rob, I was so excited you asked us to be part of it. You asked Dom and I to come in and we're going to do four shows. You know, each week we're going to have a show targeted on some form of cybersecurity around internal operations with PAX-8 and almost trying to expose those humans that are there protecting you on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'll end with this. If you are in a company, if you work somewhere where you have cybersecurity teams or you have an MSP that does your cybersecurity, this is the month to thank them. This is the month to say, I get what you're doing. I don't want to learn all this stuff. It's a pain in the ass. It's too technical. And that's why I need to trust you. And that's why when Rob or Chance comes to me and says, Matt, I need your attention, I drop everything because they are the ones protecting me. And I appreciate you all. And I'll start by saying thank you for everything you all do. And I'll spend each of this next three weeks making sure we spend time thanking our teams that protect us every day. So God bless and thank you for all you do. If there's anything you want to close out with, say it now or forever hold your peace, and then we'll see you all next week. Uh, I just want to shout out Rob for Cybersecurity Month. He's done basically all the work, and it's awesome. It's so great. Oh, yeah, thanks, I'm going to keep that belt though, bro. That's Our mine. team is dope. <laughs> like, it's so fun just to, to be part of this team. So Find you find yourself a cool security team. That's that's the, the key to True. it all. <laughs> True story. Yeah. Well, Don, let's close us out. We'll see us. you next week. Thank you for everything Thank you, you so do much for Pax 8. That is our show for the week. I forgot some introductory housekeeping that I better catch up with now or I'm going to get in trouble. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe. You guys did a lot of comments in today. We really appreciate that. That's great. Pax yeah. 8 Beyond Registration is still open. And last I checked, it is officially Q4 early next year. Uh, pricing goes up for Beyond. So if you're at all interested, grab your ticket now. We'll see you next week. We're going to have more extremely talented humans from Pax8's cybersecurity team on with us. And have a great weekend.